We were sad to lose Delegate Aird in the recent November elections. She had represented the 63rd District, which is Petersburg and many rural areas to the southwest of Petersburg, since January 2016. She holds the special distinction of being the youngest woman ever elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. Former Delegate Aird's professional reflection, life reflects her conviction that the struggle for equality begins with political freedom and education. Working side by side with the president as chief of staff and as a member of the executive leadership team at the Richard Bland College of William and Mary, she helps today's students become tomorrow's leaders. Delegate Aird earned her undergraduate degree from Virginia State University in 2008. She is a graduate of the University of Virginia's Sorensen Political Leadership Program, a graduate of the American Council of Education, Virginia Network for Women in Higher Education Senior Leadership Seminar, seminar and a graduate of the Virginia Commonwealth University's Minority Political Leadership Institute. She was awarded an honorary degree of Humane Letters from Virginia State University in 2019. We know former Delegate Aird is an ally on core issues. She was the lead patron for our pay stubs bill in 2020 and the minor fix in 2021. Workers of Virginia are now required to receive pay stubs because of her work and your advocacy. Last year, she patroned Virginia's Interfaith Power and Lights Water as a Human Rights Resolution. Again, it passed because of her leadership and your advocacy. She also championed and passed legislation prohibiting public colleges and universities from discriminating against people with minor criminal convictions and a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis. We know La Charisse aired as a passionate advocate and a thoughtful legislator. We couldn't think of anyone who would do a better job of helping us know how to be the best advocates possible. Welcome to our friend and fellow justice warrior, La Charisse Aird. Good morning, and my heart is so filled. Thank you so much, Julie, for such a kind introduction and my deepest appreciation to the Virginia Interfaith Center for the invitation to participate in another exciting day um, for both you and many of your advocates as you prepare for lobbying members of the Virginia General Assembly. I just want to say I'm extremely excited to have this discussion because you all are already so powerful. And my message today is simple. As advocates, as citizen lobbyists, know your power because it is grand. I took the time to reflect on those advocacy approaches that were most impactful to me when I was a legislator. And they really are very simple. So I took the time to jot them down. And there really are five basic principles that I am going to challenge you to embrace as you prepare for your own advocacy and a day of lobbying. So I have to say at the onset that this is twofold. There is an approach to take when you're actively in session, but then the work doesn't end in the interim. In fact, the interim is a gift to you as citizen advocates and citizen lobbyists. So number one, preparation is so important. That means know the core of your advocacy. There's one thing to care deeply about something, but if you really care about something, you do the work, the research, the fact finding, and you begin to prepare for the keys to your messaging, the keys to who you need to be talking to, to actually move the dial on an issue. And that takes time. But do not skip this step because it is the difference between your advocacy being effective and not. What message are you trying to deliver? And how are you planning on delivering it? A lot of the effectiveness that you have in your power depends on the words you use, the approach that you take, and the framing that you put your messaging into. The easiest way to turn a legislator off 
is to frame a message in way in a way that's hostile. It's not inviting. It's unwelcoming, and they feel attacked. So part of your preparation must be that deliberate legwork to understand not only what your advocacy is about, how you're going to categorize and frame that advocacy, but the words you're going to use to try and convince others to buy the advocacy uh, issue that you're selling. And so as part of that legislate that preparation as well, you wanna make sure that you recognize the actual legislation that's going to affect the issue that you care about and that you're advocating for. And this is the part where I'm speaking specifically about advocating and being part of the legislative process when we are in session. So you've done all the preparation, you know what you care about, you know how you want to frame that message. What are the bills that you are going to be trying to push? And so that work needs to be done as part of your preparation so that when you actually arrive to speak to a legislator, you're not uncertain of what you are, what action you're asking them to take because all of this leads to what? An action. Prepare. Next, know your mark. You should not walk into any legislator's office and not know their political affiliation. Although that doesn't drive you, you need to know that information. Know a little bit about their background. What are the lenses in which they are arriving at their decision-making and making these decisions? So like what type of district do they represent? What is the makeup of that district? Not just geography, but the kind of people that uh, might align with your issues that they represent, particularly if you're not their constituent, and then know something about them. Oftentimes this work is about relationships and how you can bridge the advocacy, the issue that you're advocating for with things that they already innately care about. So before you actually begin your advocacy with a legislator, know something about the approach that you're going to take. And you can only do that by knowing a little bit about them. So know your mark. Strategy, this is so important. While I would love to tell you that you should just show up at a legislator's office and you should expect that they will receive what you are offering and in good faith, go and act on those things. That is not the game. Unfortunately, governing and the politics of governing, they are part of the legislative process. And so number one, when I say know your power, there is no greater power than being a constituent. And so if you are not the constituent, having a constituent with you, having constituents in that uh, district that that legislator represents, they are the key to that legislator truly and fully hearing you out. I can remember personally back in 2017, I had a young woman who arrived in my office and she was very passionate about an issue that she cared deeply about. And in this case, it was um, about the safe um, exchange during custody uh, exchanges. And I sat and I listened to her and she was um, really concerned because a exchange had gone bad and she wanted to prevent that from happening to other families. And when I tell you the story stuck with me, when I tell you her passion, really came through because she personalized her own experience, there is nothing more powerful than that. And so when you can give a legislator a real authentic life experience behind a issue that you're advocating for, and it's from a constituent, I guarantee you whenever this issue becomes comes up again and in front of them, they will forever remember that interaction. And so being a constituent, having an authentic experience, um, that makes such a difference and that must be part of your strategy. Furthermore, legislator education. Don't put legislators on a pedestal and believe that they are all knowing and that they are arriving at these issues with all of the background information that they need. You be the expert and provide them with that information. Particularly during the legislative session, this is a sprint of policymaking. And oftentimes legislators are inundated with so many issues in a short period of time. And so in as much as you can clearly and concisely convey your issue of importance, 
do not assume that they are all knowing. Provide them with the education so that they can make the best decision, the decision you want them to make. And furthermore, I would say accountability and follow up. That legislation that you care about until it has passed, you need to stay in touch even after the meeting. Is there any additional information I can provide to you? And their staff will be helpful. So include them as part of your strategy making. Provide them with a document that can be left behind. So even though this issue might not be before them today, maybe it will be before them tomorrow and their staff can provide them with that. Um, and so make sure that you're following the issue, the bill perhaps that you care about all the way through. And the accountability must be part of the strategy. It is so critical. Once that action has taken on that legislation, follow up with a thank you. Thank you for the action that you took. Or I'm disappointed that you didn't support me, but I hope that we can continue working on this moving forward. Your work as part of this advocacy doesn't end. Make sure you follow it all the way through. I also want to share that there are no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. Be mindful of the way you interact with both the staff and the legislators on the issues of importance to you. Because although they are not with you, perhaps on one issue, you may need them and they may be with you on another. And so as you are advocating for your issue of importance, make sure your interaction is respectful, it's open-minded, and it's, it's um, engaging in a way that says you are not attacking them, you're not approaching this from a hostile position, and lay a foundation that will allow them to want to continue to work with you regardless of what positions you each held on an issue. And lastly, I will say, and this speaks more to even um, after the legislative session, and that's build the relationship. A friend of mine told me some time ago that you move at the speed of your relationships. And that means when you have a legislator that you know uh, you need to work with, don't just contact them, don't just call them when the legislative session is going on. Go to meet with them in person, uh, obviously post COVID, hopefully we can get through this at some point and in-person meetings will be a thing again, but go and meet with them and sit down with them and get to know them when there is more time to actually connect. That will make your interactions during the general assembly session so much more seamless. And when they can put a issue with a name, a constituent, um, and they can do so in a way that's personal because you have taken the time to build that relationship with them, it truly makes all the difference. And so I started out by saying that the interim is a gift to you. It is a mistake to think that you should only interact with your legislators during the general assembly session. That actually is the most difficult time. But if you stay in touch in the interim, you take the time to educate them on your issue and you introduce them to more and more people throughout that break of time before it's time to actually act on policy, you stand far more um, of the ability to positively influence the issue that you care about a lot. You know, I am going to end this the way I started. Know your power. Legislators are put in these positions because of you. They are responsible for their actions and you must hold them accountable. But today, as you speak to very important issues, do so in a way where you've prepared, you know your messaging, you know how to frame it, and you're gonna communicate it in a way that's clear and concise. You're gonna know them before you walk into that room so that you can make that connection clearly and leave something behind so that they can reference the interaction they had with you well after you are gone. I am so grateful that you have committed yourselves to advocating for the issues that you care about when you can be doing so much else. But now is more, more important of a time than we've ever, and I know you hear this all the time, than ever before, but we must protect our progress. And so just thank you so much for committing to doing this work. I look forward to continuing to stand side by side with you, and I hope the rest of your advocacy day goes well. Thank you. Thank you, former delegate Aird. And I can see why our staff team loved working with you. We appreciate so much your, your help in telling us how to be good advocates.
And now I would like to introduce Mary Fowler, the Executive Director of the Virginia ACLU. Mary is new to her position. She started June of last year, but she is not new to Virginia and advocacy. Mary is an experienced executive director and has served in multiple roles during her career, including legal director, advocacy director, and professor. Most recently, she served as the legal director for the Muslim Advocates. She previously served as legal director for the Southern Poverty Law Center and the ACLU of Virginia. Mary has had a long and varied relationship with the legal justice uh, center, with the legal aid justice center, serving as legal director of its immigrant advocacy program and director of advocacy and for five years, its executive director. The ACLU has been a partner with BICPP on many issues, most recently on a board on abolition of the death penalty, an issue on which the VA ACLU helped VICPP get financial support for the campaign through its national office. I can assure you, nonprofits seldom solicit money from other nonprofits. It was very much appreciated. We are excited about our continued partnership with the ACLU, not necessarily on all of their issues, but on very important ones that we value and have on our priority list. We're asking Mary to share with you about the voting access constitutional amendment and why BICPP should help with this, both during the General Assembly and after the GA. And Mary, be sure to tell us about the bipartisan leadership on this bill. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much, uh, Julie, for that kind introduction. Um, and I'm going to talk about where we are with voting rights with a kind of brief possibly annoying uh, kind of historical framework, because even though I, I want to get to the, the modern day and I want to get to the messaging that may resonate, I think it's really important that we recognize first that where we are is a product of our history. The, the title of kind of the little slideshow I was going to show you is called By Design, Felony Disenfranchisement in Virginia. And, that, and I think the title is important because we should understand kind of where we are in our choices to disenfranchise many, many Virginians as part of a consistent and fairly sorry history of being consistently over hundreds of years, one of the hardest states in which to vote. And that just has been our history since before the Civil War. Before the Civil War in general, until about 1850, only white men who owned property could vote. Now that may not sound so unusual, but in other states, white men who didn't own property were often allowed to vote. So Virginia, even in this context before the Civil War, was more restrictive than it had to be. In the 1860s, uh, the, you know, we passed our core constitutional amendments uh, protecting the right to vote. But it's important to note that there were exceptions. So for example, in the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery, the language is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime shall exist within the United States. And that's, that's an important exception that has been made. Um, that is, we are allowed to treat people you know, fairly terribly when they have been convicted of a crime. Um, after the war, after the Civil War, Black men were very active participants in the Constitution of 1867, the Underwood Constitutional, that institutionalized the rights of Black men over 21 to vote. But very quickly, Virginia uh, began to erode and eviscerate the rights that were protected under the, Wood, the Underwood Constitution. The state constitution was amended to disqualify voters convicted of certain crimes. The General Assembly required courts send a list of all convicted people to voting registrars, and then poll taxes were implemented. By the 1890s, a large percentage of Black men and thousands of white Republicans in Eastern Virginia were effectively disenfranchised. And so that brings us to 1902 and the 1902 Constitution, which is just a key moment in our history that reverberates today. The purpose of the 1902 Constitution, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, because this is the language used by those who drafted it, 
was to purify the ballot box, purify the ballot boxes. Carter Glass um, of Lynchburg, who drafted the voting rights constitutions, blatantly acknowledged that the purpose of the convention was to disenfranchise black voters. Here's what he said. The elimination of every Negro voter who can be gotten rid of legally without materially impairing the numerical strength of the white electorate. So discrimination was the purpose in that constitution in enacted enacting the constitution, the number of black voters declined by about 90% following the constitution of 1902. And Virginia became the state with the smallest proportion of its adult population participating in elections. And that is, I'm sorry to say, a theme that has continued throughout our history that we are have been until just a couple of years ago, consistently among the hardest states in the country in which to vote. Um, Virginia's 1902 constitution included felony disenfranchisement. And that means people who have been convicted of felonies, felonies are, are permanently denied the right to vote. Um, and, you know, and here's what, uh, here's what the founders said in, in or the, the drafters said, I do not believe in universal suffrage. I believe that Negro suffrage has been a curse, a curse to white people and an imminent threat to the Negro. So this is a provision that has stuck with us through today. And, and there have been modern changes, obviously. Poll taxes, which were part of the constitution, were struck down by the courts in 1966. Literacy tests, which were also part of the constitution, were outlawed by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But the provision that disenfranchises people convicted of felon felonies continues to exist in our constitution and is enshrined in our constitution. Virginia is now one of only two states that permanently takes away people's right to vote upon a felony conviction unless the governor restores it on an individual basis. As I said before, Virginia was until just two years ago, the second hardest state in which to vote in the country. In 2020, we made great strides in expanding ballot access and advancing voting rights, right? We, we went from uh, being the second hardest state to being in the top 12 or so. We expanded ballot access. You don't need an excuse to vote absentee. You can register to vote on election day effective later in 2022. You don't have to provide a photo ID. Election day is a state holiday. Those are huge steps forward for Virginia. In 2021, we passed the Voting Rights Act of Virginia, which made Virginia the first state in the South with a state level voting rights act. It was a huge progress for us that included some of these provisions, restri repealing restrictive voter ID uh, laws and passing temporary measures to make voting during COVID-19 easier and safer. So here we are. We Here we are with a constitution that is so deeply con committed to the idea of disenfranchising people that we have enshrined it in our constitution. And so what does that mean? That means to change this provision uh, we need to actually change the Constitution of Virginia. And how do we do that? Uh, Virginia last year, the General Assembly passed a right to vote amendment um, in 2021. Um, that would restore the right to vote to about 250,000 people uh, convicted of felonies and some individuals with disabilities as well. Um, it did not, it was not the, it was not the perfect bill. It was not the bill that we had hoped for. We had hoped that it would actually include people who are currently incarcerated because in many states, people in prisons and jails can vote. Um, but that, that the provision to allow people currently in prison to vote was, was peeled out. Um, still the provision would restore the right to vote to about 250,000 people. That the bill needs to pass, the amendment needs to pass again during this 2022 session um, and it needs to pass in identical form. So it can't be modified in any way um, and if that happens, it will then be placed on the voter ballot in November of, 19, of 2022. Um, so I wanted to talk just a little bit, um, following up uh, Delegate Aird's really uh, phenomenal comments about the messaging um, and how we talk about this. I think it is important 
for us as advocates to understand the truly racist history of where we are in Virginia and why people are denied the right to vote. More than 50% of the people likely to get the right to vote back through the amendment are black. And that is, as, as um, I mentioned, by design. Now, I think we need to, we need to, as Delegate Aird suggests, think about the messaging. It may be that, although we analyze our work deeply, profoundly through a racial justice lens, it may be that that, that is not a messaging that resonates with every single legislator. We talked, um, for example, to people in Florida who were active, um, who were kind of leaders on the um, effort to get a similar provision passed. And, and they told us they did a lot of message testing and there were things that really resonated with legislators and voters um, that, that were um, maybe different from the way that we you know, kind of talk about this in, in pure racial justice lens. Um, they, uh, for example, when they did message testing, they found that voters found the phrase right to vote off-putting, but they found the the phrase eligibility to vote uh, compelling and persuasive. I, I said, you know, of course, you do understand that those are exactly the same things. Um, and they said, you know, absolutely, they understood that. But it is it is important to think about that. And so the messaging that we've been kind of thinking about is letting the voters decide. That's all we are asking legislators to do, right? If they pass this a second time, all that happens is it gets placed on the ballot for voters to decide. And that's the compelling message. Democrat, Republican, this should not be a partisan issue. And we do have uh, some Republican votes. We're, we're fairly confident, in fact, that if the amendment can make it out of committee and to the House floor that we do have bipartisan support to pass it. Um, it is critical, however, that we get it through the House committee so that it actually gets this chance on the House floor to allow, uh, allow voters to decide. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for you know, being here and for thinking about these issues and for your commitment to making Virginia a just and more equitable state. We've come a long way. We've come a long way in just a few years. And there is so much more for us to do to right the wrongs of the past and to create a just and equitable commonwealth. Uh, and I look forward to working with all of you in, uh, in creating the commonwealth that we, um, that we see. And I saw just a, a quick answer to the chat question. It's uh, privileges and elections is the House Committee that is looking at this. Um, so I, I thank you all, and I'm glad to answer any questions or comments that whenever we get to that point in the in the um, proceedings. Thanks. Mary, thank you so much. And feel free to respond in the chat, because I know that folks are, are typing questions in the chat just in case we don't get to do them live. I'm Aisha Galani-Taylor, VICPP's Director of Communications. Having everyone voting is so important for all of us. And as Mary just shared with you, we have a shot at this becoming a reality, given that we have bipartisan leadership. Our voices could really matter. So take out your phones or open to another tab on your computers. And now I know we've had a problem this week in sending emails and doing these petitions. We basically broke the system because <laughs> there were so many people doing this at once. So we rock. Um, but we worked with our tech folks to create some workarounds to handle us, and we're going to do this a bit differently. We're going to break people up. We're going to start with people whose last names begin with A through L. And then we're going to wait three minutes and then go to L to S, and then I'll prompt you. tinyurl.com slash voter access VA. Oh, Ann Murphy's went through. Yay! <laughs> awesome. Yes, I would also go back to yesterday's. Um, let me share that. And that was tinyurl.com slash no solitary. And I'm putting that in the chat. And I think what we can do is we can put all of these um, petitions, uh, these email uh, opportunities in the weekly roundup this week. So uh, it's kind of full, but we can sort of list a bunch of them so people can go back if you didn't get a chance on each of these. Yes, and that goes out today. And if you don't already receive the weekly roundup, our weekly newsletter, 
please send me a message uh, in the chat and I will make sure you get that. Last names starting in L to S. It's your moment. Those of you from the next and final group to go ahead, the T to Z. So your cue will be when Lisa stops uh, speaking. I work at Kroger um, 515 in Atlee, uh, Atlee Road. Um, and I wanted to speak about why we need sick leave. Um, we really should know why we need sick leave. Forgive me if I look at my notes here. Um, in this day and age, businesses should uh, understand um, and keep up with essential workers with their happiness, their health, their safety. Um, when someone who works with you says that they're sick and that they um, know that they shouldn't be there, but have to be, um, it makes you scared because they can't afford to be for that person who is ill, scared that you might contract what it is they have, scared that you, um, scared for the community that you serve, scared that um, there's, a, there's not many things more scary than a lack of choice. And that's what this creates. Um, the choice um, of making a bill or not um, because you're sick is it's not a choice. You you have to make it. Um, the fact that there is a lack of laws about this currently uh, it makes us question um, our leaders and if they truly care about us. We care so much about the community we serve. Um, we rather rather not pass on anything to them other than kindness. Um, and their families that we see today, we don't want to, you know, have them contract anything from us either. Um, it's heartbreaking to see people who want to serve so much suffering through their day um, rather than seeing a doctor or getting much needed rest. Um, it shouldn't be trivial that the person serving you is healthy. Are, it shouldn't be assumed that they are at this point either until we have the ability to step back and get what we need as far as seeing a doctor or um, rest. Um, the consumer is at risk. Um, please take care of all of our communities. Um, those that are there serving day to day deserve that. Um, and those that are coming to our store deserve to know that they're in a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, Lisa is one of many grocery store workers um, who needs paid sick days, right? We all need paid sick days. So it is almost time to start your legislative meetings. Um, most Senate meetings are at 10 o'clock. Uh, delegate meetings are mostly at 1030 or 1045. Not every meeting was able to get scheduled, but you should have been sent information about your meetings. Please check your emails and your trash folders. Um, and I can assure you that getting Zoom links to the right people for roughly eight, 80 different meetings has been crazy challenging. Uh, but uh, again, most of them are going to work. We'll probably have a few folks don't get to the right place at the right time. But again, it's an amazing feat. Um, and I honestly don't know any other uh, nonprofit advocacy group that's doing this level of meetings virtually. It's really very challenging. You've heard the priorities over the last couple of days. They are one, limiting the use of solitary confinement. You heard about that and the importance of not having people be tortured over more than 15 days in solitary. On day two yesterday, you heard about the need for this training of healthcare professionals around unconscious bias. 
So again, not a complicated issue, but a really important one. You heard about it. Third priority for us, paid sick days. We've been working on it for a couple of years. So you all probably know all about this one, but just in case you didn't, uh, Lisa, I think conveyed well to us why we need to be fighting for this for uh, workers in Virginia. Um, our fourth priority is affordable housing. Uh, in every region in Virginia, people talk to me about the need to invest more in affordable housing. These are budget amendments. They're gonna come a little bit later in the process, uh, but any of you who have members on the finance committee or the appropriations committee, you're gonna be talking to them about the need for affordable housing. We've sent all of the leaders for your meetings, the core messages, right? And the core messages really relate to what committees they serve on. Your job is really not to be the policy expert on any of these. Your job is to convey that you, as a constituent in the district, that you care about these issues and that they're priority issues. And again, I think the messages that Delegate Aird, former Delegate Aird gave us in terms of if you have a story about it that makes it personal, that makes it real, tell those because we all know um, that, that stories really are more impactful on people than any of the facts are. We can follow up with details. You get questions that you don't know the answers to. My staff and I can follow up on it. Um, but your presence with the legislators will really matter. So thank you for your advocacy today um, on uh, this important voting rights uh, amendment. Um, and one last note before we close our session and you get ready to sign on to your next Zoom call, probably with a Senator. Uh, there's supposed to be snow all over Virginia on Friday. Um, we had planned to have the prayer vigils outside on Friday, um, but it looks like that is not gonna be a good day for us. On the other hand, we are concerned that some of these issues uh, on solitary could well come up next week. Um, and so Aisha has been on the phone a good part of yesterday, talking with all the leaders, trying to see if we could reschedule them for some time Sunday, some, some of them before services, some of them after services, some of them in the afternoon. Because uh, again, the snow is supposed to go from Thursday night to Saturday. Um, so the timing that would make sense for us is Sunday. So we are trying to nail down the times and all the locations, and they will be sent out to you later this afternoon when we send out the weekly roundup. Um, the weekly roundup sort of always comes out on Wednesday, sometimes a little late, but always on Wednesday. Um, this is really the place where we try to consolidate the information uh, for you. Uh, so Thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you for your advocacy. Your advocacy really matters. Thank you so much. And we do have a closing plenary this afternoon at 2.45. Again, you've been sent that. Here's the information on it. God bless. Stay safe. Hope your meetings go well and look forward to hearing about them. 